Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Hello again, people. Um, yeah, I know. I just filmed a few days ago, but um, one of the reasons that I was planning on doing a video today, anyway, was because of the weather. Uh, as I've said many times before. Uh, this garage has no heat in it. Um, winter, it's, you know, time is approaching, it's autumn, and today uh, it was um, uncharacteristically warm. And really just today, tomorrow's going to be a lot colder, supposedly. But um, silly me, I ended up waiting till, uh, you know, the sun's down now, it's evening, so now it's getting colder in here. Um, had I done this during the day, um, I would have been a lot warmer. But um, I was off visiting my dad, so um, I didn't get to do the video. And I've got this weird thing. I like I like doing my I like recording my videos at night. Um, I don't know during the day, even you know, I'm inside whatever. My attention is just all over the place because I'm just aware of you know there's things going on outside of my condo building here, and you know landscapers and people coming and going and stuff like that it's a little, it's a little too hectic um, so I prefer the nighttime so I was planning on doing a video today anyway but I had nothing to talk about so I was just gonna do some vinyl pulls and I had one of these weird coincidences and I swear all these weird coincidences have only happened to me since I started the last couple of years pretty much since I started making videos um, and this one doesn't actually involve anybody else except for me. But I did talk about this weird coincidence that I had um, where I pulled out my, my Dave Grusin and my Don Grusin uh, albums um, just a couple weeks ago just so I could compile and burn an MP3 disc to play in my car. I hadn't listened to their music in years. And um, the first day that I had the disc in my car and I was driving to visit my dad, um, uh, the first album that came on that was on the MP3 disc was the Don Grusin album, and I'm listening to it. And as soon as I got to uh, the the room where he's in the uh, physical rehab facility, uh, I put on the TV, and I'm watching the show, which ended a few minutes later, and up on the credits for the show, it says, Music by Dave Grusin. Um, so I thought that was just a weird coincidence. So I had another one. So, uh, for, for no reason at all, just yesterday, I got the mood to listen to um, a Pat Metheny album I rarely listen to because I'm not a huge fan of it. Uh, Pat Metheny's Bright Size Life, his first solo album ever. Um, it's just a trio. Uh, Pat Metheny and, uh, f you know, fairly early in his career, uh, Jaco Pistorius on bass and Bob Moses on drums. So this, this is, you know, one of the more stripped down uh, albums of, of his career uh, and his first solo album recorded in December 75 and it came out in 76. And this is a lot more um, really basic, you know, uh, there's, it's pretty much just an electric bass, simple drum kit, not a lot of overdubs and just pretty much six string electric guitar. Now there's um. And that's that's it, you know. And as you know, get, uh, Pat Metheny, you know, he's he's credited here also playing electric twelve string, but I don't I don't hear it. I don't hear the electric twelve string. I hear it on his next album, Watercolors, uh, but I don't hear it on here. Um, and it's pretty much a you know very basic. There's no keyboards, no guests, no additional musicians. Um, Metheny doesn't play acoustic guitar, no guitar synthesizers. So you know, which he's known on his future albums pretty much for having uh, a variety of instruments you know of various types of guitars and guitar synthesizers and blah 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 yeah and so this one is very basic because it's pretty much just a six string electric guitar throughout the whole whole disc um, I think there's only one track that is a, a guitar solo uh, in that there's no bass and drums on there there's there's two overdubbed guitars on there um, so there's like a rhythm part and a lead part, which is probably my favorite piece on the album. Um, and apart from that, it's pretty much straight trio stuff, almost most of it live. 
Um, pretty much, you know, without guitar overdubs and maybe a, a couple tracks um, do have a second guitar overdubbed, you know, like a rhythm and lead part. Um, but it's it's very basically that that the, uh, very clean sound. He doesn't alter his sound a whole lot in this. Um, didn't wasn't quite using that that soft that softer uh, like digital delay sound that he had on the first Pat Metheny Group album, which was two albums after this. Um, and this is one I have. Now I listened on CD. I don't I don't spin my albums anymore. Um, but um, I just pulled the album out so I could show it because it looks better than the CD on the screen. So I, you know, and, and I'm not. I, I have over 30 Pat Metheny albums. I, I should have counted them before I did this video. Um, I, and yet I don't consider myself a fan. He's got su such this, this loyal fan base that even when he comes out with an album, it's not even worth reading the fan reviews of on Amazon, which I always do for any artist I even care a little bit about. But he's he's got that kind of following that everything is great, you know, everything he does is great, and uh, oh, you know, this is his best album or one of his best albums or best he's done in years. You hear that with every single album he puts out, and uh, any dissenting votes, anytime somebody might enter slightly negative or critical review of an album, they get torn apart. I mean, you know, I just don't like that kind of that kind of rabid following like he was the Beatles or something like that. You know, it, it's just, I think, I don't know, I think the Beatles even are, you know, can, you can say more criticism about their music than you can with the Metheny fans. Um, so, like, as far as, you know, reading reviews of Metheny, it's, it's almost worthless. Um, so I don't consider myself a fan, and I really I have a ton of albums by him, uh, including uh, a much later, I want to say uh, probably in the late 90s, uh, a rare trio album that he did of just guitar, bass, and drums, which is a lot different than Bright Size Life, though. Um, so I just had the desire to hear it, and I, and, and I rarely ever, ever listen to that one anymore. And one of the reasons is because I do listen a bit to... Um, the, the two volumes of works, Pat Metheny's works compilation that ECM put out. Uh, and, and there's, I think, four tracks, three or four tracks, I want to say four tracks, from Bright Size Life on those compilations. And three of the tracks are tracks I can't stand at all. So if anything, um, it, it kind of, and there's only eight tracks on the album. Um, so if anything, it kind of creates a negative uh, opinion looking back on the album, but then I realized that there's other tracks that I do like, you know, much more than the ones they included on the works compilations, but it's never enough to make me pull back and go back and listen to Bright Size Life. But for some reason, I just got the, the, that desire to hear him in that stripped down setting. Now, I have a ton, a ton of guitar trio recordings of guitar, bass, and drums, uh, j especially in the, in the jazz realm. Um, so, you know, usually when I want to hear that, I don't put on, like, a Pat Metheny album. But for some reason, I was just in the mood to hear, you know, the Pat Metheny thing, and there's no ballads, seven of the eight tracks are originals, um, and, and their tracks, a um, couple of them have been recorded in other places. I want to say, um, Gary, uh, maybe one or two of them were recorded with Gary Burton, too, when he was in Gary Burton's band. And when I want to hear early, early Pat Metheny, I tend to go more to the uh, Gary Burton's Passengers album than anything else. Uh, but for some reason, I wanted to hear Bright Size Life. I just wanted to hear that that uh, very simple six-string guitar, bass drums thing going on. So I listened to it. Yeah, that, that was great. And then, to, and then today, uh, I had this uh, odd coincidence where, uh, and this is totally unrelated to Pat now, um, there used to be a distribution company, and it was based out in Jersey, but what they did is they uh, distributed uh, European jazz um, albums, mostly CDs, because this was the in the late 80s, I guess it was about the mid-90s. Um, company was called DA Music, and if you buy a lot of imports, CDs, I don't, I don't think they were really doing vinyl. Vinyl was pretty much gone at that point. Um, but... Um, if you have a lot of uh, import albums on a few different labels, uh, mood label, the Mood label was one of the big ones. 
mood records and uh, and several other labels probably based in Germany uh, were distributed by this company that was based out of New Jersey called DA music now at the time you could go into any physical record store that had a jazz section and easily find their stuff I don't know if that's because the distribution company was here in Jersey uh, but I got the feeling that their distribution at the time pretty much got all over the United States. Well, fast forward, and I, you know, and I had I have a bunch of these releases. Fast forward to uh, uh, you know about 15 years later, or 12 years later, whatever it is, and surprisingly, DA Music goes out of business. Um, and I'm not sure what they were. I'm not sure if they were just a, an American company that did the distribution for some of these German and these small jazz labels over here in the US or whether it was a, a branch of a European company that um, was based in the US but for whatever reason they closed down their distribution arm and with that these these albums these albums on the on like the mood record label and places like that stopped being available here in the US uh, you could buy them as imports maybe uh, depending on what label it was and what album it was, um, perhaps somebody else may have picked them up for distribution. But for the most part, uh, unless they were a big artist, very well known in America, uh, the DA Records stuff um, went bye-bye. And um, a couple of the things that I liked very much that were on there that were very easy to get on CD at the time was something like the Miroslav Vitas Miroslav album from... Uh, I was 70, well, recorded in 76 and 77. Um, that was one of the things that they released that I actually bought on album back in the day. And then uh, DA Music distributed the CD when it came out on CD, once that era hit. And um, they, they did a couple of Randy Weston albums that I have. And I, maybe the Randy Weston albums may have been picked up because he's a fairly well known American artist. But um, th these DA Music releases, and a lot of them on, on Mood Records, um, I think Robert Schroeder was another one, the electronic artist, um, and his stuff, since they went out of business, uh, those, I don't know, 10 albums or so, whatever they distributed by him, haven't been available here in the U.S. since, since DA Music went went bye-bye. Um, and they also had some artists that here in America are pretty much totally unknown, and possibly in Europe too, not necessarily big, big jazz artists or well known at all. And those things did not see, uh, for the most part, um, distribution here in the U.S. again. So in DA Music, I had ordered a bunch of stuff from them um, by mail order when they were still here, and one day I get this uh, notice that basically. I don't know if they announced that they were going out of business, but that's essentially what it was. And you could, for, I don't know, like $25 or $50, $50, whatever it was, get like 25 randomly selected CDs. They were just taking their stock and just selling all their stock. And these were new CDs. They were sealed, but they were mainly cutouts. They had the little, the little cutout notch on the spine, like you, like you would see here. You could see, if you could see that, you know. But apart from that, they were new. And I think they had a bigger deal. I could have, like for a hundred bucks, I could have probably gotten 50 or something. I forgot what I got. I remember ordering this big box and maybe I was not so aware at the time that they were going out of business. Also, this was before the online stuff really hit. Ha you know, had this sale happened now, I would just buy 500 CDs or whatever with the uh, eye toward reselling them. But back then, uh, you know, the Amazons weren't around yet and, and things weren't being sold as much online. So it was like, well, what am I going to do with all these? So I went for one of the sets. I, I want to say I probably got, I can, I can picture the box coming in the mail in, in uh, with all the CDs in my, in my mind. And maybe it was, uh, I don't know, it might have been as many as 50 CDs in there. Um, uh, and only a couple were ones that I had. A couple were by artists I'd never heard of, which is, you know, kind of the thing that you are, are looking for because for next to nothing you're getting to sample these. And over the years, and this was a number of years ago now, I'll say this is probably about a dozen years ago. And over the years, I have given most of these away. Um, 
I, I kept them all together at one point in a in a big storage box, a plastic storage box. So I knew that these were the ones that I got at this big budget price. Um, but by the time I moved here five years ago, they were pretty much all gone. And I don't know where they went. I mean, some of them went into my private collection, uh, you know, because they were things that um, I was interested in hearing. And I played, and even if I didn't like them, I kept them. Uh, others were maybe duplicates of things I already had, so I gave them away. Um, what amazes me, though, is that is that I, I really don't have any of them left, uh, except for a very, I have a small handful left, um, but, but probably less than 10. <clears throat> and those are, uh, apart from the ones that I kept, but I mean, there's, uh, you know, I, I might have 10 that are like duplicates that I still have um, of things. And out of, out of all of those that I have left, though, there was two, two, only two, where's my fingers, two. There was two that I never opened, um, and to be honest, they didn't look that interesting to me. Um, I kept them, they were still sealed, and um, I just never opened them. They were, they were uh, a, a couple albums that had no musicians I'd ever heard of. Uh, they're roughly in the jazz realm, I guess. Uh, I never really even did an internet search to find out about them. Um, and one of them, I decided for no reason at all, I picked up, I'm always walking by this, it's, it's, it's on a shelf in my place here that I walk by and I see it a lot. Um, and I have for a, a couple years, you know, more than a couple years now. Um, and it's just one that I always kind of eyeball. I don't know anything about the, it's three musicians, they don't, they don't even list on the CD what instruments they play. For some reason I figured it was a piano trio. Um, and it's called the, the Sagmeister Trio, which is Michael Sagmeister, who's the leader. And it's an album uh, recorded in Germany. Uh, so he's a German musician um, in 1978. Um, and for some reason, I pick, and every once in a while, I just pick it up and I look at it. And I just, I look at it, I'm very frustrated by the fact it was sealed, that they don't list the instruments on there. And for some reason, I thought it was a piano band and I didn't know any of the three musicians involved and when I took a look at it uh, yesterday I, I pulled it off the shelf again I saw Volker Kriegel's name on there which I had never noticed before I, and I made sure to, to look to see if uh, like there was a guest appearance by Volker Kriegel the late guitarist who the late German guitarist who I liked very much and uh, who was a partner of Everhard Weber's played with him a lot uh, he was in the United Jazz and Rock Ensemble. He was one of the founding members of that. Um, and he played with them until he passed away. But uh, just reading it, uh, it seems like... Um, see, all the stuff in the back is in German. So they didn't even, interestingly, do really an American and English translation. Um, but it looked like uh, Volker Kriegel was just credited with supervision and some other German word that I don't know what it means. But it didn't look like he was playing on it as a guest. But um, I hadn't seen a lot of albums that that had a production credit by Volker Kriegel. And I think it's possible he was part owner of, of Mood Records now that I think about it. And I think he was, which may be why, you know, uh, his name might appear like a Manfred Eicher would appear on an ECM album. Yeah, now that I think about it, I think he was part owner of Mood Records, so he, he could be the uh, overall, essentially, the producer, which may be why his name appeared on it. But after seeing his name on it, I got a little curious, and um, I decided to open the CD and play it. Well, actually, first I went on YouTube to see if there were, if, if there were any tracks from the album. Hopefully the whole album would be up there, um, so I could hear it, because I'm not sure if I wanted to open it. And uh, there's one track which I'm going to try to remember to link. Uh, I created a little folder, because as it turns out, the leader of the band is this Michael Sagmeister, uh, is a guitarist after all. Had I known this was a guitar trio, I probably would have played it, I would have played it years ago. Um, and um, I found a single track, one track only, uh, on YouTube from this album, but there's a whole bunch of other Michael Sagmeister um, tracks from individual albums on YouTube, a lot. Uh, I think it was 117 that I found. 
And even though he was he was German, uh, he played with Pat Martino. He, he made some records, or at least one album with Pat Martino, the American guitarist based in Philadelphia. I don't I don't know how they hooked up. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a good thing I keep something to drink nearby. <clears throat> I always try to keep something to drink nearby, and I almost never never need it when I'm making a video. So uh, through the years, it appears that, that he's still active. His last record that I looked up was just a few years ago, I think. This Michael Sagmeister, back in 1978, was apparently very, very young. So um, I opened the CD after hearing this one track, and it struck me quite odd because it sounded like Bright Size Life. So here is this album that I just pulled out and listened to again for the first time in years, yesterday. And a couple hours later, something drives me to pull the CD off of my shelf that I've had for between 12 and 15 years and never listened to. And I find this one YouTube track, and I'm like, gee, it's guitar, electric, bass, and drums. And on the one track I heard, it sounds amazing. It sounds like something that could come off from Bright Size Life. Now, Bright Size Life, that Pat Metheny album, sounds a little bit different than any other Pat Metheny albums. So it's quite unusual that this one album that I just randomly picked out by these, un, you know, by these totally unknown musicians to me, and I was in the mood to hear that kind of thing, would sound just like that album that I wanted to hear because I wanted to hear that kind of sound. So after hearing that one short track from the album, I'm like, now I gotta open it and listen to it. So I opened the CD, I listened to it, and I'm shocked by the coincidence. First of all, it's got eight tracks, just like the Pat Metheny group album does, the, the Pat Metheny Bright Size Life does. It's got the same exact lineup with electric bass, not upright bass, but electric bass, drums, and electric guitar, uh, and, and it's pretty much the same thing. And honestly, you could take this album, copy all the tracks over, and sell it as outtakes from the Bright Size Life sessions because it sounds like other, it, it just sounds like a continuation of Bright Size Life. Now, this was recorded in 78, 1978. By that time, Pat Metheny had only about two albums out or his third album was about ready to be released. He wasn't a big name then. And I kind of doubt he was a big name in Germany, especially, which is where these guys were, um, these musicians are based out of. The three, it's just a guitar, electric bass, and drum session, just like Bright Size Life. It's got eight tracks, just like Bright Size Life. It sounds like Bright Size Life. The guitar has the same exact sound that Matheny has on the Bright Size Life album. And exactly the same. And the, the length of the album is almost identical. Uh, the Bright Size Life is 37 minutes and change. Sagmeister Trio is 38 minutes. Um, and the interesting thing is how much the electric bass player sounds like the way Jocko Pistorius sounds on Bright Size Life. Now, if you're real familiar with Jocko, Jocko went... So I'm not a fan of Jocko's playing at all, okay? But, but as far as the um, aggression and the busyness of his playing... Um, which came pretty much around like 78 or so. Um, if you listen to Jocko on Bright Size Life, he's a lot more subdued um, than, than, than the kind of playing that he was known for. I want to say laid back, but um, yeah, that's probably true. His playing wasn't, wasn't as busy. Uh, he wasn't you know, necessarily just playing a zillion notes because he could type of thing. And it's odd how much this bass player um, sounds like Jocko, but specifically the way that Jocko was playing on Bright Size Life. I am 100% sure that these guys at this stage, when they recorded this album in 1978, had probably not heard Bright Size Life. Um, it had only been out at that point for a, a couple years at the point that they recorded this, and Matheny, I don't think, was um, a big star in Germany at that point yet. And as far as the bass player sounding like Jocko, Jocko wasn't that big yet. Jocko only started in Weather Report, I think, in 75 or 76. Uh, so his reputation was being made while the Sagmeister trio was there. But in 78, he was just starting to get the kind of attention in America um, that you know became the legend of Jocko. 
So this bassist, Udo Kistner, K-I-S-T-N-E-R, which I know, I know nothing about the musicians on here, um, had obviously been playing for a whole bunch of years, so it's not like he grew up being influenced by Jocko, because Jocko was only around pretty much for a couple of years before this was recorded and recording. And I mean, you know, Jocko was only recording for literally a couple of years, and this, ba you know, the bass player on here had obviously been playing for some time, and I don't think he would have been influenced that quickly and sounded that much like Jocko um, in the matter of, you know, hearing Jocko play maybe a few months prior to this. So it's interesting how similar the bass, the electric bass style is to, to the way Jocko plays on this. And again, not the way Jocko plays on most of his other albums because his playing got real busy real fast and very, very hyperactive, um, you know, by the, by 78 or 79 or so. Um, so it was weird. And, and the thing is, this isn't recorded in um, the ECM studios, but it has the same sound. The way that the drums and the bass and the guitar are recorded, it sounds like the Bright Size Life recording. Like I said, you could easily fool somebody and copy these songs and said, here's a bunch of outtakes and songs I recorded for Bright Size Life that they didn't use. Um, and it's just weird because I've had this like I said, for between 12 and 15 years, I never played it. And all of a sudden I got in the mood to hear this, you know, this thing, this, this type of album, like the Bright Size Life music, which made me pull out the Pat Metheny album. And then a matter of a couple hours later, I, I, I start playing this. It's just, it's just one of those weird, weird, weird coincidences. And Probably if I had, you know, if I had more money and I was working, I, I wouldn't have pulled this out at this stage, uh, you know. But I'm going back into my archives, so to speak, and I'm revisiting albums, um, and I think I'm probably going to be doing a bit more of that. I, I have been to a certain extent. I mean, the thing that made me pick out the the Dave Grusin and Don Grusin albums that I hadn't played in a decade um, is simply the fact that I, I I'm still buying some new CDs, but not like I used to. You know, and and so I'm, I'm going back into the into the archives. But once in a while, it's interesting to note that you go back into the archives, or I go back into my old stuff, and I like to re-examine not the albums that I loved and that I know really well, but the ones that uh, didn't hit me at first, or I didn't get, I didn't really understand what was going on, uh, which is like, for instance, a lot of classical music. Um, and revisit those and sometimes it just takes years of your listening becoming more sophisticated to really appreciate um, so I'm jumping back and I'm, and I'm pulling out things that I only gave a couple spins to and, and kind of put on the shelf because they didn't really do it for me you know for uh, various reasons um, not because they were too commercial because the two commercial ones I still don't like you know but but there's others that are kind of like you don't understand the direction or it doesn't speak to you immediately. Those are the ones I like to go back to. And, you know, if I, if I find and I pull out any of those, I'll probably start doing a series of things that um, I'm listening to or, you know, a series where um, that consists of albums that I really love a lot but that I didn't get at first and I kind of put on the shelf and I, and I left there for years which is why I never get rid of pretty much almost any of my albums or CDs is because of that factors. I, I often buy things that are kind of way over my head and if I don't like them at first I might put them on the shelf thinking you know I might never listen to that again but I'm keeping it anyway and then I you know at some point do get back to them and sometimes it's like oh I get it now and you know there, there's some album I can't recall what it is recently that I had that experience with but uh, when and if I come across that particular album, I'll do, I'll do a video on it because it could be a whole series of things that were just over my head that I didn't appreciate or I didn't understand the direction of or wasn't really in the, in, in the mood to hear it at that time that years later I pull off a shelf and they become favorites of mine. And uh, so that's it. I can't believe I'm talking about two albums here and the strange coincidence and it's a half hour. Um, so I'm not going to do any vinyl pulls, but I will next, uh, next time, uh, I'm going to come out here and do videos as often as the weather permits because it's coming to an end soon. Uh, within 
probably three weeks, four weeks tops, uh, probably more like three weeks. It's probably going to be too cold to come out here and film. So uh, I think, you know, and, and when I'm going to do my future videos indoors, I won't have my, my stacks of vinyl. I, I do have some indoors, but I don't have them set up so I can just randomly pull them. Um, so I brought a, a, a bunch of uh, additional vinyls out tonight. Uh, I took a fistful, about mm, that many albums, and I filled the back shelf. You know, I have a small gap in there from the albums that I pulled out uh, for my various videos. And um, I took a random selection, I don't even know what's in there, and kind of filled the gap in there. And hoping that, you know, it's not just more ECM, which it probably is, and, um, and Klaus Schultz album, which it isn't, because I, all my Klaus Schultz albums are already back in there. Um, so hopefully there'll be a little more variety when I do my future vinyl pulls. And, uh, you know, next time the weather permits, I'll come out here and do another video, and, and I may not have anything to talk about mm -hmm. again. And um, I might just do nothing but vinyl pulls and fill up some time doing that. And I was going to do some today, but this is already going too long. So I just, you know, just one of those weird coincidences that, that happen when you're a music fan, I guess. I think the only people that would understand this are people that are hardcore music fans that, that had something like this odd coincidence happen. I don't know anything about Michael Sagmeister and the Sagmeister Trio. All I know is last I knew he was still alive when I looked him up today and uh, made a whole bunch of albums as a guitarist and is a teacher, has been teaching, uh, I guess, a, a jazz guitar, probably, um, somewhere in Europe. He, he taught at Berkeley, believe it or not, for all, he actually came to America and taught at Berkeley for a number of years, uh, which I just, all this I just found out today. A good guitarist, by the way. I, I quite enjoy it. As a matter of fact, dare I say the Pat Metheny fans come after me. I actually like the Sagmeister Trio better than Bright Size Life. And just from the, um, I've actually spun it about three times today. Um, but it's right in that same direction. Uh, if you love uh, Bright Size Life, and the, now the odd thing is I talked about how these are out of print, but when I went on Amazon, there's actually copies there. Very, very strange. I'm sure this is out of print in America. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're carrying copies over from Europe, or uh, these are just leftover copies. I don't see this being a big seller. So... I saw them on Amazon. I didn't look anywhere else for them. So that's what's going on. Uh, unlike most of my videos where I play my own music underneath, I've been playing the Sagmeister Trio. I hope it's it's probably quiet enough. You probably can't really hear it. And uh, if you can, maybe you'll get a little taste of it. And I don't hope I don't get any kind of copyright issues. I, I kind of doubt it. This is pretty obscure. And there's no like cover tunes on here, which is where you run into a lot of problems. Uh, all these originals by, by Michael Sagmeister on here. Um, and he's already got, like I said, 117 tracks on YouTube. And I will put the link for the folder. I put just a couple of, oh, here's another coincidence. I, this, is, this is the big one. Here's the thing that really connects them. I can't believe I almost forgot this. So I'm looking online on YouTube, and I see that in, I think it was 1992, Lyle Mays, the keyboard player of the Pat Metheny group, did at least some type of tour. He did some concerts. There is a concert filmed uh, uh, from TV in Germany. So it was a, a performance in, in a TV studio in Germany of a, a Lyle Mays band. And, uh, and I want to say, I, I think it's from 92, but you know what? I took the video and I put it in the same folder as the uh, Sagmeister, Michael Sagmeister track so you could see it. So Lyle Mays is playing in this German studio with this fantastic band. He's got uh, Steve Rodby from the Pat Metheny group, which is maybe not a surprise. Um, but he's got William Kennedy from the, my favorite drummer from, that the Yellow Jackets ever had. So he was in the Yellow Jackets for a lot of years and is, is back in the Yellow Jackets now. Um, he had Dave Samuels on vibraphone. This was a hell of a band. I never knew these guys played together. But here's the weird thing. There's a guitarist in the group. The guitarist is Michael Sagmeister. Uh, all this happened today. 
all this happened today. You know, the whole thing with playing Bright Size Life. I opened this album. It struck me how much it sounds like Pat Metheny. Uh, you know, there's eight compositions. The running time of the album is the same as the Pat Metheny group album. Uh, Pat Metheny solo album, not group album. But the, the, the one thing that... Uh, is the most unlikely and really the one thing that connects them is apparently Michael Sagmeister was somehow picked by Lyle Mays to play in his band at some point. Uh, and that, that really blew me away. That really blew me away. So there's that weird, that, there's even more of a weird coincidence. That's the fact that made me want to make the video and then I almost completely forgot to mention it. So that's just weird. It's just weird. So, and I don't think uh, I know Lyle Mays. I know there was a uh, a live album, uh, you know, of an old performance that came out of his not that long ago. But I don't think it was that band that had Michael Sagmeister on it. But you can see the video to see that Michael Sagmeister is playing um, with Lyle Mays, and it is uh, in my folder that I will try to remember to link. So I'll be back to talk about, you know, probably just do some vinyl pulls from the back shelf, the back shelf, the back shelf. I still don't have the hand thing right. And uh, hope everybody's doing well. I will be back. Take care. Take the music for a minute. Here, I'll turn it up a little bit. Okay, I don't want to get the copyright then. Okay, guys, I'll talk to you later.